Twitch begins testing sub-only streams. And more coming up on today's episode of The Lace and Tech News. Hey Gadgeteer, you're just in time for the latest episode of the world's only 3-in-1 show on tech, gadgets, and gaming news. That's right, this is The Lace and Tech News. My name is Taylor Merrick, and well, I know you're expecting a show yesterday and the day before, and well, to be frank, I'll tell you what happened. No internet. And I finally figured out the reason why today. And I posted about this on, on our Twitter uh, feed, at Tech News Gadget, if you don't follow us there, that it turns out in my neighborhood, they were doing construction work on railroad tracks and hit the underground internet cable line, which knocked out internet for most of the people in the area. Thank you, construction workers. Big round of applause. Hopefully you actually did the job right this time. Hopefully you know how to do your job right. And um, I'll, 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 um, with that being said, I'll pertain from uh, um, rendering any more uh, jokes on, on, on said subject. Just make sure you do the job right. Um, and you won't have any complaints. So yeah, be, uh, because of that, there was no show Tuesday and there was no show Monday. And last week had a great vacation, so I'm back from that. And as far as you're concerned, barring any... Okay, now I just went and jinxed it, but there probably won't be any more further problems. Um, we won't have to worry about it anymore. Um, we should be able to get shows out for, well, weekday for the rest of the year. It's just June is usually my vacation month that I like to take off. And uh, it's nice great weather outside currently i have the window open and there, you might hear some traffic from time to time outside but nothing to do about that hope you guys are enjoying your summer speaking of which by the way i know i am um didn't get to jump in any lake or go swimming yet but i've been enjoying the warmth and being outside and going hiking and just enjoying some time off so hopefully you guys are able to do that as well i know uh i'm excited about today's lineup that we have today um, we'll be taking a look at Twitch is testing sub-only streams, followed by uh, YouTubing give YouTubing wow YouTube giving you more control over your homepage and up next videos a little bit too late there YouTube but okay great uh, also we'll be looking at Mozilla has a new tool for tricking advertisers into believing you're filthy rich also we'll be taking a look at a narrative experience coming to the PUBG universe. A robot planter that follows the sunlight and throws a tantrum if you don't water it. Apple's new messaging app doesn't need Wi-Fi or even cell service to send and receive messages. And finally, we'll be taking a look at a flying insect-like robot uh, that is getting closer and closer to independent flight. But before we get to all of that, did you know that there's a Game Boy that works with a Singer sewing machine? Yeah, it's true, and I watched it on TV last week while I was on vacation. Uh, just plug in the game cartridge, and you can operate the show sewing machine via the Game Boy. It was it was pretty incredible, and there's only only a very select few copies ever made. I think the show that I was watching for it, they were trying to pawn off or purchase it or buy it from a collector. Uh, it was actually pretty interesting. So, yeah, just in case uh, you, you were wondering, hey, can I control my Singer sewing machine from my Game Boy? Yes. Yes, you could. So, with that out of the way, let's move on to the next one. Well, <laughs> the next one being uh, what happened today in tech history, being that today is June 26, 2019. On this day in 1997, the Communications Decency Act was declared unconstitutional in a U.S. Supreme Court ruling of... 7-2, to two, uh, the act passed by both houses of the Congress sought to control the content of the internet in an effort to keep uh, well X-rated content from minors. In an opinion written by Justice John Paul Stevens, the Supreme Court ruled the act a violation of free speech as guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution. I guess the ACLU was involved in this. I don't know. It was, it was really weird. Um, the only thing I'm going to say about that is... When it comes to the First Amendment right, all it does is guarantee that the government will not infringe upon the right bestowed upon said individual, not by the government. 
So also on this day in history, in 1974, a universal product code known as UPC is used to ring up a purchase for the first time at a Marsh supermarket in Troy, Ohio. The first item scanned was a 10 pack of juicy fruit gum. Take that to your trivia contents, guys. So <laughs> with that out of the way, let's head on to today's feature story. All right. So first up, Twitch. Not not the symptom of, you know, you, um, I don't know, bouncing around abnormally uh, in everyday life, uh, but the, the, the video game streaming site uh, owned by Amazon is testing subscriber-only streams. Finally... A new interesting feature, one that I had been wondering for quite a while if they're ever going to introduce said thing, and I guarantee you, if the test goes well, which I don't see any reason why it shouldn't, I guarantee you other streaming services, including YouTube, will start looking at this if they haven't already. I'll put a pin in that one. Um, start rolling out some feature of this as well. So, a Twitch channel subscription might soon get you considerably more than emotes ad-free viewing, and access to special chat rooms. The service is launching a beta for subscriber streams or live broadcasts that are, well, you guessed it, limited to people with active subscriptions, mod privileges, and VIP status. It won't be thrilling if you don't like paying for Twitch, but it could help creators who want to reward paying fans with behind-the-scenes specials, all request game sessions, and other perks. Non-subscribers will still get a preview of these streams with immediate access if they choose to sign up. On-demand videos will be available to subscribers while clips won't have restrictions. Now the beta is available now to any broadcaster who has reached affiliate or partner status. And yes, Twitch is aware of the potential for abuse by creators who might want to lock questionable content behind sub-only live streams. Now you're only offered to well, allowed to offer subscriber streams if you haven't violated community guidelines in the past 90 days, and anyone can report potential violations even if they only saw an offense during the live previews. This does risk creating different tiers of Twitch experiences where some content is locked behind a paywall, but me personally, I don't see any problem with that. However, it could easily appeal to experienced Twitch broadcasters hoping to boost their subscription counts that in turn could lead more Twitch users to either start broadcasting in the first place or step up their efforts. You might benefit simply by seeing more and higher quality streamers, even if you have no inclination to pay. So what are your thoughts surrounding this, guys? Now, I know I personally, well, I've been in the live stream arena for a while um, on Twitch, but I seem to find my home more in Mixer. So I know this is true for Twitch, but what about for Mixer? What do you guys think if you stream on Mixer? Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section if you're watching this video. And if you're listening via the podcast, hey, shoot us a message over on Twitter. That's where we're usually active and chatting with all of you guys. I know um, new features abound and, and, and introduced properly and implemented correctly can be very much benefit um, to the community at large and so long as you do it right i don't i don't see any problem with this i mean twitch kind of has to change or die you can't keep something going the same forever without it dying out you gotta you gotta innovate that's the beauty of tech so i for one am quite excited about this uh i can't wait to see what happens maybe on the mixer end of things on the youtube side of things but yeah i mean i i always thought like here's my thinking Way back when, with live streaming, I said to myself, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, why in the world would I want to pay $5 a month to get an ad-free viewing experience and access to emotes? I feel like I'm not getting anything. I'm uh, All I'm literally doing is I'm subscribing to a channel that I don't have to worry about seeing ads pop up on. I get, you know, perks letting me know I can use this emote i also get like vi uh not vip i can also get uh, like a subscriber message like for resubbing or or certain uh indicators of how long i've been a said subscriber which is always cool for great bragging rights but i was always like but why is that worth five dollars now i don't know if ninja has weighed in on all of this maybe he has uh and what his thoughts are but i don't know for me i was like why would I want to do that? 
you know, give me, give me more value. Well, maybe this could be the start of providing said, quote, more value behind subscriber-only streams on Twitch. Now this would kind of give me a reason as to why I would want to subscribe to said person because they'll have subscriber-only streams, and then I'd be more inclined to watch because it's, like, paid for content like cable although cable offers way too much and they watered it down anyways so i don't know that's what i think so far on this very interesting development coming from twitch can't wait to see how this rolls out can't wait to see how the test goes if other platforms decide to start adopting it but more importantly love to hear what you guys think so be sure to drop your thoughts in the comment section Moving on to some more tech news, YouTube is well, finally giving you more control over the videos its algorithm puts in your face. Now, here's in as much as I'm going to say about said topic without becoming too controversial one way or another, even though I already know what my thoughts are on this entire um, narrative. Uh, YouTube's recommendation algorithm doesn't have the best track record. It's been caught mixing up inappropriate videos featuring popular kids entertainment characters. Eh, not to say that YouTube Kids uh, has been doing any better, pushing home videos of children of pedophiles and even radicalizing youth towards extremist politics. Uh, this, that, and the other thing. But it's kind of stupid because it's looking at an algorithm protected by, well, obviously trade secret by YouTube. And YouTube said, well, I guess we'll just have to adjust the algorithm this way and the other way in this, and it's great. But here's as much as I'm going to say on it. Why couldn't you ever give that control over to the viewers on your platform watching your content? I mean, this is the great, this is the great mystery of, like, the internet for, like, the past, like, four years now is going seriously have you are you new here like i remember back in a day when hulu ran ads and you could say i like this ad or i don't like this ad and hulu could then tailor its interests the best way possible or if it was inappropriate and you didn't want to see these kind of ads you could say block this kind of ad all of this information fed back to hulu and they figured out, oh, these are the kind of ads people want to be shown. Same thing with the TV shows. There's very specific, limited type of content we want to watch. And we'll go looking for it. And if we don't find it, we ain't going to watch it. And unless your recommendations are based on our viewing patterns and viewing history and what we like to watch and don't like to watch. And you happen to find out stuff that we like and we keep clicking on it. You can track all this kind of stuff. Then what's the point? Um, Jeez. So here we go, roundabout again with YouTube. Against that backdrop, the video platform announced it's going to start giving users greater control over what content pops up on their homepage and up next videos. Apparently, that was a big problem too. People said, stop letting this autoplay feature happen. You want to know how difficult that was? Click, I just turned it off. I rarely have autoplay on, my, on any of the YouTube videos that I watch. Rarely ever. So when the video stops because it's reached the end, that's all I see. Hello? <sighs> YouTube, YouTube. You have a great legacy of doing something stupid without knowing it and then backtracking to do the right thing. How about do the right thing first, put your foot down, draw the line in the sand, and say this is where we stand. Too bad. Jeez. <clears throat> so on YouTube... Tuesday, YouTube outlined three changes it plans on implementing over the coming days. First, users will be able to explore topics and related videos if they scroll up on the homepage when browsing up next videos. So if you like ASMR, you might find a topic suggestion for ASMR videos. If you're an aspiring baker, you might find a baking topic. And um, YouTube says that the options are based on existing personalized suggestions, but may also be related to a video you're currently watching or similar videos published by that channel. The second change is you'll be able to remove suggestions for channels you have zero interest in watching by tapping the three dot menu and selecting don't recommend channel. Most interesting is YouTube's third change. Suggested videos will now feature a small box underneath explaining why this video in particular is being suggested for you. Wow. <laughs> 
That's stupid. All of these are welcome, if not overdue, changes. YouTube's algorithm has been, well, not too lightly run through the mud by people from all over the place for random and various reasons, some of which border on um, uh, overtly stupid to, are you drunk? Um, so, yeah. Um, that said, the raw these features will be gradual and somewhat sporadic. Explore topics will be available for signed-in users on English on the Android YouTube app only. The remove channel feature, however, will be available globally on I Android and iOS starting today. Meanwhile, only iOS users will be able to figure out why videos are being suggested to them today. YouTube says all the features will come to every platform, iOS, Android, and desktop soon, but didn't offer up an exact timeline. This is ultimately a baby step in the right direction, though it'll take a while to see if it has any impact in addressing, well... YouTube and the bigger Google problem of oversight and uh, just leaving stupid things alone. Uh, but on the bright side, well, maybe you won't be getting videos suggested if you didn't want to watch them in the first place, to which I said, right, that's why you didn't watch them in the first place. So, all right, enough said on said topic. Uh, let's move on. So I found this one interesting. This is an article by Gizmodo. By the way, if you guys are interested in getting all the show notes uh, and the articles that we've mentioned therewith, head on over to technewsgadget.net to get all your show note goodness for today. If you're watching on YouTube, there's a link down below in the description. If you're listening via the podcast, well, you're in luck. The links we used to the articles in today's show are right there in the app for your tapping pleasure. All you got to do is literally tap on the link and it'll pop open the whole entire article. So, Mozilla has a new tool for tricking advertisers into believing you're filthy rich. So, if you've noticed the ads being served to you are eerily similar to stuff you were just browsing online, it's not all in your head, and it's the uh, insidious truth of existing online without installing a bunch of browser extensions. But there's a tool now that, while comically absur absurd in execution, can stick it to the man, namely advertisers, by effectively disguising your true interest. Well, hope you like tabs. The tool, called Track This, was developed by the Mozilla Firefox folks and lets you pick one of four profiles, Hype Beast, Filthy Rich, Doomsday, or Influencer. You'll then allow the tool to open 100 tabs based on the associated profile type. Data brokers and advertisers build a profile on you based on how you navigate the internet. It's been known for quite a long time now. If you haven't heard about this before, welcome. Um, this is how it goes. Uh... It, it, they build a profile based on how you navigate the internet, which includes the web pages you visit. So whichever one of these personalities you choose will, theoretically, be how advertisers view you, which in turn will influence the type of ads you see. So the author of this article tried out both the Filthy Rich and Doomsday Prepper profiles. It took a few minutes for all 100 tabs to open up for each on Chrome, and if you're a computer that doesn't have much RAM, just know that you might have to restart after everything freezes. Now for the former, there are a lot of yacht sites, luxury designers, stock market sites, expensive watches, and some equestrian real estate brokers, a page to sign up for a MasterCard gold card, and a page to book a room at the MGM Grand. For the latter, links to survival supplies and checklists, and tents, and mylar blankets, doomsday movies, and a lot of conspiracy theories, or a hazmat suit. Um, now, as Mozilla noted in a blog post, announcing the tool, it'll likely only work as intended for a few days, and then will revert back to showing you ads more in line with your actual viewing uh, preferences. This will show you ads for products you might not be interested in at all, so it's really just throwing off brands who want to, to advertise to a very specific type of person. Uh, you'll still be seeing ads. Eventually, if you use the internet as you typically would day to day, you'll start seeing ads again that align more closely to your normal browsing habits. Of course, you're probably not going to fire up 100 tabs to routinely trick advertisers. The tool is more of a brilliantly ridiculous, if not trollish, nod to the lengths we have to go to only temporarily be a little less uh, intimately targeted. But, well, troll away if you want to. You just have to update it every few days. So if you want to have fun, uh, it's called Track This, and uh, you can go to trackthis.link. Have fun. All right, moving on to some uh, gaming-ish kind of news. A narrative experience is coming to the PUBG universe. And, uh, well, 
See, here's the funny thing. PUBG probably isn't the first game you think of that's begging for a story-driven element, but it isn't stopping its creators from trying. I think rumor has it that they've been trying to do this for quite a number of years now and never really succeeded because PUBG apparently took up too much of their time trying to fix bugs. As part of an announcement that Sledgehammer Games co-founder Glenn Schofield would run a new studio, Striking Distance Pub. G Corporation revealed that the just formed unit is working on an original narrative experience set inside the PUBG world. What that entails isn't really clear, but um, we wouldn't rule out frying pans and chicken dinners and might have an underlying backstory accompanying each. Uh, Showfield at least has the experience to make it something special. If you don't know who he is, he's best known for leading the development behind Dead Space at Visceral Games, but you may recognize him as the co-founder of Sledgehammer Games. There, he spearheaded work on Call of Duty games ranging from Modern Warfare 3 through to 2017's World War II. Now, it's now clear where Showfield ended up after the turmoil at Sledgehammer kind of spit him out and PUBG went, oh, yoink! Now, there's no firm timeline for the game. However, the real question may be about its chance of success. PUBG's arch-rival, Fortnite, also has a more story-driven world called Save the World, uh, which has preceded the Battle Royale option, but quote unquote according to a Fortnite audience nobody ever plays yet if that was a problem nobody would be playing it and it wouldn't even be an option but whatever uh, as virtually anyone can tell you though its audience is a tiny fraction of the multiplayer base striking distance will have to convince gamers that it can avoid that outcome and create an experience that stands well on its own and there's a youtube video to go along with it introducing striking distance so hopefully good luck to them and uh, good things to follow Moving on to some gadget news, I know most of you are interested in robots doing the work for you. Well, this robot is a robot planter that follows the sunlight and throws tantrums if you don't water it. Now, I know this is a couple months old, but uh, I figured, figured I'd pull it out of the uh, archives here and, um, well, let you guys feast your um, robot goodness and 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 wallet on on purchasing said device because well this could revolutionize your life uh it starts off dear fellow and aspiring houseplant people there's a new must-have planter and it's so much more than a trendy terracotta pot a robot planter can keep your house plants alive because we now live in the future even if your thumb is anything but green your home can still be an eden of ivy and ferns all of this thanks to a new robot friend that doesn't look like the sweetest six-legged spider you have ever seen. The future is now, people, and spider plant in a quarter of, well, at least the author's room is here for it. Dogs and cats are cool, but millennials seem to be more into house plants than house pets. A National Gardening Survey in 2016 reported that out of 6 million people who took up gardening in 2015, 5 million were millennials. Now you can pick up a new house plant friend in your coffee shop these days. It's safe to say a lot of us are avid indoor gardeners and with a robot planter well now you can get healthy plants but also a makeshift house pet a hexa plant as so-called here dancing on the screen um for us if you're watching the video at least was created by vincross's founder son tianqi after he witnessed a dead sunflower yeah pretty sad uh, at the flower expo that could have been saved if it were just moved into the sun so he thought what should i do his solution Create a robot planter that will move the plant according to wherever the sun is in your house. Like a cat always trying to catch that sunny spot by the window. Well, this planter has one mission, and that's to keep your plant alive. It will find the sun for your plant, and then the shade when the plant needs to cool down. When your plant needs water, it will throw a temper tantrum, uh, as seen here by stomping around so you know to grab the watering can. But just because it's paying most of its program mind to your plant, it doesn't mean it won't interact with you. Per food and wine, the Hexa plant can reportedly play with you if you touch its base. If he has the ability to spin around and even does a happy dance in the sunny spots of your home because vitamin D is powerful, y'all. Now think of the Hexa planter as your indoor gardening assistant. While you have to prune and water your plants, the planter will make sure to get the optimal lighting. It doesn't just crawl to the light, it spins so every leaf of your precious plant can soak in the rays. Now if that's not considered innovation, well... You're probably watching the wrong video then, so uh, get out of here. Um, caring for our plants is, well, pretty impressive, and now we just don't have to worry about it as much. Really, all we have to do now is watering the plant. <laughs> so if you guys are interested, the Hexa planter is not yet available for purchase, but the original Hexa is. 
for a cool price of 950 bucks. So, if you're interested, there's a link, and you guys can learn more. All right, moving on to some more gadget news. Oppo's new messaging app doesn't even need Wi-Fi or even cell service to send and receive messages. Now, you might be wondering to yourself, what newfangled technology could possibly exist? To explain this, it's not new. I've known about it for quite a while. Now, uh, in addition to showing off the world's first phone with a camera under the screen at MWC 2019 in Shanghai, Oppo unveiled a unexpected smartphone feature, especially for a smartphone maker from China. It's called Mesh Talk, and as the name hints, it lets you connect to other phones around you. There's no need for Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or cell service to get the job done, and it works over distances of up to 3 kilometers, or 1.86 miles. Now, this nifty new technology could help you communicate with others in all sorts of instances where regular service isn't available. Now, for those wondering, Mesh Talk isn't a new concept as chat apps exist that deliver the same type of chat experience. There are even devices that let you talk and text on any smartphone without Wi-Fi or a cell connection. However, Oppo's app will be built right into its Android devices, which means you'll have access to Mesh communication right out of the box, and that includes text, voice messages, and regular phone calls. At times, we encounter extreme situations where there's no network coverage at all, for example, when you just arrive at an airport in a foreign country, or when you take an off-road trip or attend a concert, football match, or exhibition, Apple said in a press release via VentureBeat. This tech offers a solution to such scenarios in which other network connections are unavailable or, frankly, bogged down. So, finally, we have an answer. Now, now you guys, I think after hearing that statement, you could probably understand a little bit more why this kind of seems cool. Mesh talk could be useful during natural disasters or to connect people living in remote places, sure. But you might also want to use this particular type of tech um, when, well, say an oppressive regime turns off access to the internet during episodes of public unrest or where a government tries to forcefully shut down an encrypted app that's used by demonstrators, um, such as unfortunately what happened in Hong Kong. That's why it's surprising to see why a Chinese smartphone maker unveiled this particular type of chat app, which might not be in the best interest of the Chinese government. That said, it's unclear how secure Mesh Talk app is compared to end-to-end -end encrypted services that require internet access or how well it protects the user's privacy, but remains to be seen. But outside of that, pretty, pretty impressive. All right, moving on to our last article of today. Yes, we have more gadget news. I didn't find any gaming news. I, do, I just covered the gaming news. I talked about Twitch and, and, and YouTube. No, well, Twitch, that, that was gaming, right? Well, if you want gaming news, uh, or more specifically, a certain type of game you want to be informed on, hey, be sure to let me know down in the comment section down below, or if you're listening via the podcast on Twitter, we are at Tech News Gadget. I'd love to be able to keep an eye on the games that you guys want to hear more about, uh, and I'll keep an eye on it for you so that you don't have to sound good so a flying insect light robot flits closer to independent flight and we got a photo on screen of it just over six years ago when researchers at harvard announced that they had made tiny flying robots they immediately began talking about the prospect of their tiny creations operating autonomously in complicated environments now that seemed wildly optimistic given that the robots flew by trailing a set of copper wires that brought power and control instructions, and the robots were guided by a computer that monitored their positions using a camera. Now, since then, the team has continued working on refining those tiny machines and giving them enhanced landing capabilities. And today, the team is announcing the first demonstration of self-powered flight. The flight is very short and isn't self-control, but the tiny craft manages to carry both the power supply circuitry and its own power source. Now, there are two approaches to miniaturizing something, which you can think of as top-down and bottom-up. Now, from the top-down side, companies are shrinking components and cutting weight to allow ever smaller versions of quadcopter drones to fly, which some are available that weigh as little as 10 grams. But this type of hardware faces some hard physical limits that are going to limit how much it could shrink. Batteries, for example, end up with more of their mass going to packaging and support hardware rather than charge storage. And then friction begins to play a dominant role in the performance of the standard rotating motors. Now, the alternative is bottom-up. Start with something similar to the flying 
insect-like robots and figure out how to expand the capabilities. Not surprisingly, since they built the insect-like robot, the Harvard team has chosen a bottom-up approach. Now, the original design had piezoelectric motors that could rapidly flap two wings, providing the robot with powered flight. Power with the high voltage and rapid oscillations was supplied externally. The same was true with flight control information. A camera tracked the robot while in flight, and a computer figured out what adjustments were needed and sent the corresponding adjustments directly to the wings. Now, the goal of this work is to get rid of some of that external hardware, shrinking it down so it can be placed on board the robot itself, and you won't need these wires or cables or computers outside telling them what to do. Now, for this new work, researchers focused on the power source that keeps the robot airborne. So, this article goes more in-depth into looking at it, it's called the Robo B. It has an X wing design, and here it is on screen, including power and electronics. Yeah, um, yeah, it is, this is pretty impressive. Um, wow, how does it work? The included video shows that it does fly, but only extremely briefly. Typical flights are for less than a half a second and require three suns worth of incoming light. Authors term this sustained which seems like it's stretching the definition of the word. The robot mostly handles control simply by not flying long enough to have to deal with it, uh, but there's some significant room for improvement, in which the bottom-up approach model looks at. Well, definitely, definitely looks um, interesting. Interesting, I'm, uh, I'm liking this. Here's a video that goes along with it. Insects the real one. true masters. Here's a video, but that's all that we're going to see for now. So if you guys are interested, link to this will be in the show notes. And with that, that wraps up this episode of the Lace and Tech News. Thanks for tuning in, guys. New episodes every weekday, which means we'll have an episode tomorrow and Friday. Lace and Tech News can be found on every major platform, including Apple, Spotify, Google, YouTube, Stitcher, Overcast, and more. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, let us know by clicking that like button down below and by leaving a comment. Also, double check that you are subscribed so that you don't miss the next episode. I'm your host, Taylor American. Remember, for the latest in tech, gadget, and gaming news, visit technewsgadget.net. Pretty much keeping awesome, guys, and I'll see you on the flip side.